10. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one of those white Bibles uh, around you and turn to Acts chapter 10 so that you can hear God's word. The book of Acts reminds us that every believer in the room is saved and sent on unstoppable gospel mission that started in a prayer meeting. And that's why this series is called Unstoppable, because no devil, no person has been able to stop what was launched out of this prayer meeting in Acts chapter 1. Nobody is able to stop it. And we get to be a part of that. And this is what we saw Peter model for us. Go to Acts chapter 10. He modeled this for us last week. I'll just give a quick summary of what we looked at at Acts 10. Then we'll hop into Acts 11. Uh, but let me give you a quick recap. Peter showed up at Cornelius' house. This dude named Cornelius. He wasn't a believer. He was of a minority race. And he spoke up. Now watch this. Let me see your eyes. Is this, I could preach all day on this, but I got to move. I just got to move. Peter shows up at the house of a racial minority and preaches the gospel. Oh, my Lord. Did you hear that? Peter showed up at the dude's house. In Acts 10, I think it's 24, Cornelius called his homies, he called his family, and they're all packed up into his house. And Peter showed up and preached the gospel to somebody. So if you, if you hear anything, God uses majority race people to show up in houses of minority race people to tell them the gospel. That's what we see. So don't expect people to pack into this church necessarily, but expect to, to pack them into their house and show up and tell them the gospel. Whether it's a Super Bowl party, whether you're bringing them some chips, whether you just want to drop a kid off, whatever, however you get into that house that God welcomes you into, show up and speak the gospel. That's what we see Peter do. He went to them. And Acts chapter 10, look at verse 34, look at verse 34. It says, so Peter opened up his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him is acceptable. So we talked about last week, Peter showed up at their house and said, Jife, y'all remember that? Jife, can y'all say Jife? Jife, that just simply stands for Jesus is for everybody. Not just one race, not just blacks, not just whites, not just rich, not just poor. Peter shows up and says, Jesus is for everybody. God doesn't have a favorite race. He shows no partiality. And then he shows up and he tells them about Jesus. He tells them in his sermon that uh, he's in the house, by the way. We are so religious. I'm so, re I could be so religious. I'm sitting there thinking maybe he's in a cathedral or that. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking during that whole sermon that the man is like, at the church lady's house, church lane ladies. He's just up in a house telling them that Jesus brings peace. He's up in a house, not a church steeple, not the sanctuary, not a temple. This man is in the house telling people who don't look like him or talk like him, telling them that Jesus does good and he heals. Think about it. Can you see it? He's in a living room telling them, that Jesus is going to judge, y'all. He's coming back to judge you unless you trust in him and receive forgiveness of sins. He is in a living room. And then what happens? Verse 44 to 48 says, the spirit of God came down and applied forgiveness to these people. And he filled them with the spirit. And that's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to use you and me to get into the regular rhythms of where people hang out. Have you noticed that people in East St. Louis don't hang out in the gym or the Jackie Joyner Kersey Center on Sundays? Anybody? Is this just me? Is that just me that noticed that people in our city don't naturally choose to hang out at the JJK on Sunday mornings? Maybe that's just me. God wants us to be like Peter and show up to them and tell them about Jesus. That's Christianity. That's basic. 
And when he did that, and when we do that, I believe the Spirit of God is going to do some things out there that he just ain't going to do in here, as important as this is. So the Spirit of God falls, fills the believers. Then look at what happens. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, the, now let's read uh, through verse 18 real quick. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. Here we go again. If y'all been here the last two weeks, we're going back to it. It must be very important because you've heard this. Verse 5, Peter said, listen, y'all, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me looking at it closely. I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And verse 7 says, and I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered in my mouth. Look at verse 9. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's, what does it say? The man's what? House. Can y'all say house? Verse 13, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He could have told him, just go where Peter is and go to church. No, no, no. He says he needs to come to your house. Verse 14, he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved. And you and all your household, as I began to speak, Peter says, the Holy Spirit fell on them and at just as it had on us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Last verse. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. So the spirit falls. Peter goes back to Jerusalem, goes back to his homies, and they tell him, man, what did you do that for? And he told them the story of how God changed his heart and how the spirit came in Cornelius' house and how uh, the spirit moved in people that don't look like us and talk like us and dress like us. And they were like, man, I guess God is for all people. So what is the spirit saying to us this morning? Because let me tell you, whether you're here for the first time or the 20th time, you're not here by accident. What is the Spirit saying? I want to highlight just three things from these verses. Three things. Number one, listen, pride divides. Okay? Pride divides. Number two, I want to highlight that Christ unifies. Christ unifies. And then number three, God transforms. Okay? God transforms. Number one, number one, pride divides. Can you say that with me? Pride divides. Look at verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So this was spreading. Like, like the apostles, the chosen ones of God, and the brothers and sisters, this means other Christians, they heard about what was going on in the church, how the gospel got out past the Jews to unbelieving Gentile people. They heard about that, right? And verse 2 says, so Peter went up to Jerusalem, and the circumcision party criticized him. So he went to his people. You know, he went up to the majority race. He went up to the Jerusalem people, and they criticized him. They, they spoke harshly to them, and what did they say? It says, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. I mean, they jabbed him up, Terrence. They, they said, man, why you go eat with them? Gentile people. 
uncircumcised. Notice, they didn't say, why did you preach to them? They weren't excited like, wow, praise the Lord, the word of God. No, no, no. They were like, why did you eat with them? Why did you try to, why, would, why were you building a relationship with them? They're not like us. Criticized them. Why the criticism? Why Peter's people hating on him like that? It was all good when he hung out with them and enjoyed their common Jewish privileges. It was all good when he enjoyed the Jewish privileges of the majority race there. It was good. It was all good when he stayed in the all-Jewish part of town. All. It was all good when he stayed in the all-Jewish part. Of, nobody was criticizing him. It was all good when he ate at the all-Jewish table. Oh, it was all good. Nobody criticized Peter when he was with his people. Nobody criticized him when he was eating with them and hanging with him. But when he started to hang out with those people, you know who those people are, right? Did you know that the Jewish people had almost like a racial slur for Gentiles? Anybody know what it is? Anybody? dogs. The majority race of Jews referred to the minority race of Gentiles as, look at those dogs. Dogs. How are you going to hang out with dogs? We are the elite. When he started hanging out with those dogs, things got heated. So, so why the criticism? Why the hate? Don't be so quick. Don't get your answer from social media. Get it from scripture. Why the hate? Anger. Yeah, but that ain't the root. Prejudice. Yeah, that's not the root, though. What does the Bible say? Racism. I smell that. That's not the root. No. Five-letter word is pride. Pride. Racism is never the root. Prejudice is never the root. Anger is never the root. It's pride. Let me ask you something. Who is the most evil person in the world? Don't answer that out loud. <laughs> Just think. I want you to know it's not a human being. It's the devil. It's Lucifer, young people. Lucifer is the most evil person in the world. And guess what? God sent them to hell. He's sending them there. Why? He must have done something. If he's the most evil person in the world, then he must have done like the most evil thing. Was it never got blamed for being a racist? Racism didn't even exist when the devil did his dirt. He never got blamed for being a uh, sex trafficker. Sex trafficking wasn't even a thing when he did the most evil thing. If you look at Isaiah 14, Satan went down because of pride. He never had sex, never used a racial slur, but he did the most wicked thing you could ever do and say, it's about me. And because he lived for him, God sent him down. Every sin that you hate and that you do and that I do is rooted in pride. This wasn't prejudice. This wasn't anger. This wasn't racism. Those are just the fruits. It stems in. It's all about me. And we see here that pride, among many other evil things, divides in the world and tragically even in the church. Basically what they were saying is 
Peter, stay away from them and stay with us. Stay away from them. Stay with us. You see how pride loves division? Now hear this. It's true. I believe the form of pride we see here in these verses is race-based pride. What is race-based pride? It's when our racial differences seem to make us better than others. When we believe the lie that our racial differences make us better than others. That's race-based pride. Our differences, Joel, make me better than you. Uh Uh-oh, here we go, talking about race again. There have been people who have left this church and other churches because they say we, we or others talk about race. Yes, we're talking about race, but not because of the culture. Because of the scriptures. That's when we talk about race. God is bringing it up again, not social media. It's right here in the text. Listen, the sin of race-based pride seeks to keep the races separate and despises the thought of anyone pursuing true, loving racial unity. Did you hear that? That's what's going on. The sin of race-based pride seeks to keep the races separate and despises the thought of anyone pursuing true, loving racial unity. We see it here in chapter 11. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, by the way, the circumcision party, these are not unbelievers. Verse 1 says he was with the brothers and sisters in Christ. Acts 15, 5, you can mark that down for later, says that there was a sect of actual believers who still believed in their ethnic superiority. Yes, you can believe in ethnic superiority and still be a believer. They're called the the circumcision party right here. And they said, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Listen. This is not an easy topic, but the truth is this. Those who have been infected by the cancer of race-based pride, and I'm talking about professing Christians, watch this. They criticize people of their own race for building relationships with those of the opposite race. It's in the Bible. And I'm not even going to go into the names that we get called on both sides, when you, as a white person, let's just deal with white and black, because that's the most tense present reality in our country, right? When you, as a white person, go to try to build a genuine loving relationship with a black person, your white friends can, there's a name for that. When you, as a black person, try to build loving relationships with white people, There's a name for that that some people use in the culture that I won't even mention. Can I get real with y'all? Can we get real today? This is just, we're just talking about the Bible and Jesus. I remember when I lived in Houston and I invited a white Jesus loving couple to my all black church to hear my second sermon, Antonique. It was probably horrible. I'm sure it was. I mean, I'm growing by God's grace, I trust. By your encouragement, I think I'm growing. But I was excited because I met these white friends. It's a story about how we met and found out that they loved Jesus. And I was just like, I didn't know. I mean, other than a couple years in church, I really wasn't a churchy dude. So I was like, you know, I play football with a white dude's blocking for me. And he's my friend. And I play baseball with some white people. So, I mean, now that I'm a Christian and I'm preaching, I'm going to tell them to come to my church. Hey. They came to the church. They said, oh, great, Kempton, that was a great sermon. They were writing notes. That's how, you, you know, a lot of times that's the cultural difference sometimes. You know, it's not all the time, but, you know, it's like, hey, hallelujah, amen. I know they're feeling me. If a black person feeling me, they say, hallelujah, white brother's feeling me. He was, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's amazing. It's amazing. Afterwards, some black church members came up to me and they criticized me. And you know what they said? They didn't say great sermon. 
They didn't say, man, that was that was amazing. That, or they didn't say, I, no, 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 no. They said, you're a sellout. You hang with white people. They love Jesus. God bought them with his blood and made them my brothers. But I'm a sellout because I invite them into the church of the living God. Last week, some of, and I will leave them unnamed, some of the white members of our church went back home and they were criticized by their white Christian family and friends for being with those black people in East St. Louis. This is real. This is pride. But you know what? It shouldn't surprise us that it goes both ways. This personal race-based pride is in all of us. Now, we can leave systemic racism in the country for another discussion, but I'm talking about personal race-based pride is in all of us because ultimately we are all a part of one sinful human race, Acts 17, 26. And our sinful pride can be traced all the way back to our first daddy, Adam, Romans 5, 12. We're in this together. So number one, we see in these verses, their pride divides. So guard your heart because it's in there and ask God to examine you, some more than others. So pride divides, number one. But number two, here's the good news. Here's the good news. Christ unifies. Can you say that with me? Christ unifies. Oh, I love it. Pride divides. Christ unifies. Verses 4 through 14. Now, we won't rehash this whole Peter and Cornelius story again. But the bottom line is that the gospel of Jesus Christ landed on Peter. It just landed on Peter. He was full of race-based pride in this majority culture. And he was like, I don't mess with these people. I don't eat this. And Jesus gospeled his heart into seeing that Jesus is for everybody. Not only that, we see in these verses later on, based on verse 18, that through Peter's testimony of how God accepts all people, Jesus gospeled the circumcised party's hearts. Because Christ unites. The gospel of Jesus Christ landed on Peter and on the other proud Jews in this true story and humbled them. The majority, listen, the majority Jewish race here in these verses, they had to humble themselves of their sinful race-based pride like Peter had to do on the rooftop. And they had to embrace the fact that the cross declared that they were no better than or smarter than or holier than or more special than non-Jewish minority races. I don't expect the world to get this. But these Jewish people had to embrace the fact that the cross says you are no better or smarter or more special than the minority races around you. That's the message of the cross, to humble us and to shatter the pride in our hearts. Listen. The cross declares that all races, majority and minority, are equally sinful and hell-bound before a holy God, Romans 3.23. Listen, the cross declares that all races are equally welcomed and accepted into God's new racially diverse family through the Lamb of God, Revelation 5.9. Listen, the cross declares that all races are equally loved and cherished by the Father who delights in adopting multicolored children through the gospel, Ephesians 1 and 5. In other words, the gospel shouts, Jive! Jesus 
is for everybody. For everybody. And so, like I said the other week, <laughs> there is no room for white supremacy. There is no room for black power. There is no room for brown pride at the foot of the bloody cross. None. God give us repentance. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Christ himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the resurrected Savior, the one who took racially divided sinners and made us one, one. Tell you what, man. I'm going to just be honest. I, I didn't expect uh, a church in East St. Louis that God would use me and others to plant to be racially diverse. And in the early days... I confess to my white brothers and sisters, I had a problem with it. And I want to say, by God's grace, it wasn't personal. I don't think I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't like white people. But I thought God was making a mistake. Lord, you don't, Lord, wait a minute, you know we tell the Lord stuff. You did, wait a minute, God, you didn't know that East St. Louis was 99% black, did you? You didn't, let me pull that up for you, Lord. I got to pull that up. Let me see. Look at this. Lord, it's 99% black. And there are a lot of racial tensions in that area, Lord. And so when black people in East St. Louis find out that this church is, it won't, it won't go. It just won't. And the Lord says, I am the Lord. I am doing a new work. I have a new diverse people. And I express that diversity in whatever city I want to because it's my church, not yours. And I began to celebrate what I started to criticize. So you better get out of God's way. Kempton and anybody else who thinks they know what this church or any church should look like because the cross says Jesus is for everybody and he loves his multiracial families to pop up all over the world and whatever city he wants them in to God be the glory to God be the glory what a beautiful thing it simply means he's doing something more beautiful than I had ever imagined And so, what a hard yet holy honor to live this gospel truth out with this racially diverse blood-bought people called City of Joy here in East St. Louis of all places. And so, let's be praying for more grace, more conversations. They, some of them will be hard. That's okay. The cross is big enough. More healing for the gospel joy of our church, this city, and this area for God's glory. And so, even though pride divides, it won't win, not in God's diverse family, because through the cross, Christ unifies. So lastly, and we're done, lastly, uh, pride divides, Christ unifies. But lastly, what about all this prideful racial mess that's still lingering in each one of us? What do we do with that? Well, be encouraged because number three, our last point is God transforms. Can you say that? God 
transforms. I love this. It's so good news. God's transforming power is amazing. Look at what happens to the very same racially proud, critical, hating, divisive people. So in verse 3, they say, you ate with uncircumcised people? Peter, how could you hang with them? After the gospel hit them, look at verse 18. (laughs) I love it. Verse 18, watch this. It says, when they heard these things about the gospel falling on Gentiles, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Those of us with racially based pride, do you know that the gospel will silence you if you really see it? The racially based pride that was rising up in my heart in the early days of City of Joy, do you realize that the gospel silenced it? And I went from criticizing God for making us diverse to glorifying God to making us diverse. That's what happened to the circumcision party. They went from criticizing that God was a diverse God to glorifying that God was a diverse God. God can transform you too. They went from criticizing Peter for hanging out with those people to glorifying God for saving those people. Hear these words of gospel hope. If not for you, then for others you know. Some of you have had family members, relatives, people pop into your mind doing this message. Maybe this is for you to go back and tell them. God transforms racially proud people who hate on people from the opposite race. We see that in Peter. But not only that, listen to this. God transforms racially proud people who hate on people from their own race for seeking to love people from the opposite race. How does he do that? (laughs) By looking at Jesus on that cross, dying for everybody. Have you not, have you forgot John 3.16? Don't let this world corrupt John 3.16, please. For God so loved the black people that, I'm I'm sorry, for God so loved the white people, I mean the Hispanic, no, the world. That's the same word, ethnic, all races. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, believes in him, will not perish, hallelujah, for the global gospel, will not perish but have eternal life. The gospel is where it all starts. If you want to grow in the way you relate to people who don't look like you or dress like you or talk like you or vote like you or listen to the same music you do, if you want to love them in true ways, if you're a Christian, I hope you do want to love them across all the lines our culture has put up for the glory of your God. If you want to do that, then you first have to be born again. You have to be a Christian. You have to know God through Jesus Christ for you to even desire to love people who don't look like you in genuine ways. You have to have a new heart. That's what we see God do in verse 18 again. Look at verse 18. When these unbelieving Gentiles, I mean, I'm sorry, when the circumcision party heard these things, they glorified God saying, then the Gentiles also God has granted repentance Can I see your eyes? For some of you, you've never turned to God through Christ. So you have no hope. You only like, you will only naturally gravitate to people who look like you and talk like you. And and, and that's natural. And that's nothing wrong with that. But you won't have a desire to glorify God and cross the boundaries. It's hard enough for believers to do that. You need to be born again to even have the resources to live out 
multicultural Christianity. So come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. We're going to sing in a minute and respond to somewhat of a heavy word, but a hopeful word because of Jesus. But I want to leave you with one practical way to respond, possibly, to what the Spirit may be saying for the cause of racial unity in the body of Christ. Here's a possible way that you might respond. My white brothers and sisters, or as Caleb would say, my, my peach, my peach brothers and sisters. Can I encourage you, based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what I wrote down. I just Be that white person, okay? That white person who genuinely loves black people, especially Christian black people if you are a Christ follower, and boldly gospel other white people's heart who hate on you for loving black people to do the same, especially if they claim to be Christ followers. That's what Peter did. God used him to gospel the hearts of those who hated on him for hanging with those people. You have a responsibility unlike anybody else to challenge your white culture in ways that black people can't do. Peter had a platform with Jewish people to confront them in ways that non-Jewish people could not. And my black brothers and sisters, uh, kinsmen, my own people, be, based on the authority of the gospel, be that black person, all right? <laughs> who genuinely loves white people, especially Christian white people, if you are a Christ follower, and boldly gospel other black people who hate on you for loving white people. Gospel them to do the same, especially if they claim to be Christ followers. Not too long ago, I saw a brother, a black brother with an I love white people shirt. It threw me off for a minute. And I was like, wait a minute. That is the call of the day for true Christians. Guess what it is? Love. That's what sets us apart. Jesus says, if you love, one another, then the world will know you are my disciples. So I got some I love white people shirts for the black people. I got some I love black people. We ordered, we only ordered, no, I'm just playing. <laughs> Would you wear it? I don't know. Well, that's another discussion. But it's bigger than a T-shirt. Don't just wear it. Live it. Live the love, and what an opportunity City of Joy has to live that love. Would you stand to your feet as we close?